It's time for chapter 16 of Number the Stars. We're now at the penultimate chapter, which means the second to last chapter. Remember that last time Anne-Marie narrowly escaped four German soldiers and their two rough dogs from the edge of the forest on to Uncle Henrik. She was able to deliver the package and because of her, Uncle Henrik says, all will be all right. Let's start chapter 16. I will tell you just a little, okay? In this scene, I want us to think, this chapter, I want us to think a little bit more about the relationship between knowledge and bravery. In the past chapters, we've seen so many t examples of moments where characters withhold information or keep secrets in order to help other characters be brave. So we're gonna see a little bit of a connection to that thought of bravery, as well as our themes of growing up that we've continued to talk about. Let's start chapter 16. Poor Blossom, Uncle Henrik said laughing after dinner that evening. It was bad enough that your mother was going to milk her after all these years of city life, but Anne-Marie, to do it for the very first time, I'm surprised Blossom didn't kick you. Mama laughed too. She sat in a comfortable chair that Uncle Henrik had moved from the living room and placed in a corner of the kitchen. Her leg in a clean white cast to the knee was on a footstool. Anne-Marie didn't mind their laughing. It had been funny. When she had arrived back at the farmhouse, she had run along the road to avoid the soldiers who might still be in the woods. Now, carrying nothing, she was in no danger. Mama and Kirsty were gone. There was a note hastily written from Mama that the doctor was taking her in his car to the local hospital, that they would be back soon. But the noise from Blossom, forgotten, unmilked, uncomfortable in the barn, had sent Anne-Marie warily out with the milking bucket. She had done her best, trying to ignore Blossom's irritated snorts and tossing head. Remembering how Uncle Henrik's hands had worked with a firm, rhythmic pulling motion, and she had milked. I could have done it, Kirsty announced. You only have to pull and it squirts out. I could do it easily. Anne-Marie rolled her eyes. I'd like to see you try, she thought. Is Ellen coming back? Kirsty asked, forgetting the cow after a moment. She said she'd make a dress for my doll. Anne-Marie and I will help you make a dress, Mama told her. Ellen had to go with her parents. Wasn't that a nice surprise that the Rosens came last night to get her? She should have waked me up to say goodbye, Kirsty grumbled, spooning some imaginary food into the painted mouth of the doll she had propped up in the chair beside her. Anne-Marie, Uncle Henrik said, getting up from the table and pushing back his chair. If you come with me now to the barn, I'll give you a milking lesson. Wash your hands first. Me too, said Kirsty. Not you too, Mama said. Not this time. I need your help here, since I can't walk very well. You'll have to be my nurse. I want to pause right there and notice this difference we're seeing in how these two girls are treated. Anne-Marie, the older sister, has shown herself to be a little bit more of an adult. She saw that something needed done, the poor cow needed milking, and she went to milk it. She tried to do something new all by herself and tried to teach herself how to do that thing because it was what needed to be done. Whereas Kirsty, on the other hand, is clueless. She's unaware of all this drama that's just gone down in the house. She doesn't know the real reason that the Rosens left. She doesn't really understand why the war is happening. And she's not invited for the cow milking lesson. In this way, we see Anne-Marie joining the world of the world of adults or being included there. And we see Kirsty left behind in that world of children. Kirsty hesitated, deciding whether to argue. Then she said, I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up, not a cow milker, so I have to stay here and take care of Mama. Followed as usual by the kitten, Anne-Marie walked with Uncle Henrik to the barn through a fine misty rain that had begun to fall. It seemed to her that Blossom shook her head happily when she saw Henrik and knew that she would be in good hands again. She sat on the stacked hay and watched while he milked but her mind was not on the milking. Uncle Henrik, she asked, where are the Rosens and the others? I thought you were taking them to Sweden on your boat, but they weren't there. 
They were there, he told her, leaning forward against the cow's broadside. You shouldn't know this. You remember that I told you it was safer not to know. But, he went on as his hands moved with their sure and practice motion, I will tell you just a little because you were so brave. Brave? Anne Marie asked, surprised. No, I wasn't. I was very frightened. You risked your life. But I didn't even think about that. I was only thinking of... He interrupted, smiling. That's all brave means. Not thinking about the dangers. Just thinking about what you must do. Of course you were frightened. I was too today. But you kept your mind on what you had to do. So did I. Now, let me tell you about the Rosens. Many of the fishermen have built hidden places in their boats. I have too. Down, underneath, I have only to lift the boards in the right place and there's room to hide a few people. Peter and the others in the resistance who work with him bring them to me and to all the other fishermen as well. There are people who hide them and help them along the way to Galilee. Anne Marie was startled. Peter is in the resistance? Of course, I should have known. He brings Mama and Papa the secret newspaper, De Friedanske, and he always seems to be on the move. I should have figured it out myself. He is a very brave young man, Uncle Henrik said. They all are. Anne-Marie frowned, remembering the empty boat that morning. Were the Rosens and the others there then, underneath when I brought the basket? Uncle Henrik nodded. I heard nothing, Anne-Marie said. Of course not. They had to be absolutely quiet for many hours. The baby was drugged so that it wouldn't wake and cry. Could they hear me when I talk to you? Yes. Your friend Ellen told me later that they heard you and that they heard the soldiers who came to search the boat. Anne-Marie's eyes widened. Soldiers came, she asked. I thought they went the other way after they stopped me. There are many soldiers in Galilea and all along the coast. They are searching all the boats now. They know that the Jews are escaping, but they are not sure how, and they rarely find them. The hiding places are carefully concealed, and often we pile dead fish on the deck as well. They hate getting their shiny boots dirtied. He turned his head towards her and grinned. Anne-Marie remembered the shiny boots confronting her on the dark path. Uncle Henrik, she said, I'm sure you are right that I shouldn't know everything. But please, would you tell me about the handkerchief? I knew it was important, the packet, and that's why I ran it through the woods to take it to you. But I thought maybe it was a map? How could a handkerchief be important? I want to stop here. I want you to see that this milking lesson was more than just a milking lesson. In this moment, Uncle Henrik is welcoming Anne-Marie to know a little bit more. We know from the past chapters that sometimes knowing less can help you be brave when you need to be. But now that the Jews have escaped, now that she made it past the soldier, now that they're back at the farmhouse, Uncle Henrik feels a bit of reprieve. He feels that they're a bit safer and he lets her know some more information. He lets her know the big secret, that he wasn't alone on his boat. He was hiding the Rosens and the rest of the family under some loose boards in his ship. How creative, how inventive, how risky. He tells her that Peter was working with the resistance. This is something that was hinted at throughout the book, but that we didn't really know. Now Anne-Marie is on the know in these two huge secrets, she can better understand what has been going on around her. Now, as we go forward and learn about the handkerchief in the next part of this chapter, I want you to think about all of the ways that different people came together using their creativity, using their intellect to find a solution to a really challenging problem. Sometimes when we read historical fiction, we're really reading to learn about how people solved problems in the past. Because if we learn about how they solved problems in the past, how they were able to get through really difficult times, maybe, just maybe, we have a hint about how we can solve problems and how we can get through difficult times in the present. Okay, check me out for part two of chapter 16 of Lois Lowry's Number the Stars.